Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, 2013 CTN Web Seminar Series. Today, we will discuss getting multi-site trials up and running on time. Colleen Allen, E. Jellstrom, and Frankie Kropp will share the information with us. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation at specific time points. In the meantime, feel free to use the Q&A feature in your dashboard, and we will address your questions in time. Um, at this point, I would like to ask the speakers to give us a brief background on their um, experience with the CTN, and we will get started. So I turn it over to Eve Gelstrom. Hi, this is Eve. I've been with the CTN for about uh, a little over five years, and I've been the project director at the Clinical Coordinating Center, and we've been involved with a lot of the logistics and uh, protocol design and regulatory and monitoring of the trials. Um, so I'm excited you all are here today and glad to be here to speak with you. Yes, I'm passing it off to Colleen. Hi, my name is Colleen Allen. I'm the Project Director for the NIDA CTN Data and Statistics Center here at Emmis. I've served in this role for the past four years. I have uh, close to a dozen years of experience in clinical trials and have um, assisted in getting close to two dozen uh, studies up and running during that time. And so I'm looking forward to speaking with everyone about my experience today. And I'll turn it over to Frankie. And this is Frankie Cross. I'm with the Ohio Valley Node. Uh, I've been in clinical research for a little over 16 years now and been with the CTN since 2000, so a little over 13 years. Uh, in that time, um, I have served as a lead node training director and a lead node project director and have uh, served on various lead teams for um, eight trials so far. And back to you, Eve. Okay. So good afternoon to most of you and good morning to those of you who may be out in the West Coast or out in Hawaii. Um, we're happy to have you join us today and really explore some of the factors that are involved in la launching multi-site studies. Um, last fall when Tracy and I were brainstorming about this session, we, we were looking at facing this year starting about five studies, which we're right now in the thick of starting three of them and have two following thereafter. And we were really excited to be able to put together a program having um, the project directors from both DSC and CCC, Colleen and me, as well as Frankie uh, Crop uh, at Ohio Valley Node, who, you know, we've all been involved in various aspects of starting clinical trials in the CTN network. So we were just very um, happy to be able to um, get this group together and to really be able to talk to you about what what's involved. So the objectives today really are going to be talking about uh, identifying and discussing the critical components that are involved in multi-site trials. And as people always say, the devil's in the details. And we realize when we get studies going and as you go through this next hour and a half with us, you're going to hear about many of the different details that we really have to pay serious attention to to really implement a trial and, and get it going. We'll also talk about some of the preparatory activities and requirements that are needed, um, both to get the study prepared as well as to get sites prepared and ready for endorsement. And then we'll also talk through some challenges and how you may overcome any challenges that may arise. So when you look at the network, this map actually shows the 13 nodes, and it shows pretty much the four key groups that are involved in what we call the lead team. And that lead team is composed of the, these four groups, um, the CCTN on the right, um, which is um, everybody over at NIDA. There are people who do all the funding and make, these, make the network possible and the, and the studies possible. Um, then the DSC, the Data and Statistics Center, is the second group. And then the um, Node RRTC is another group that are involved with the particular sites, but also 
there is what we call the lead node group, which usually is the PI and the project director and their group of people that are involved in designing and implementing clinical trials. And then the CCC, the Clinical Coordinating Center. So that's the group that's um, involved. And today we'll really be focusing on um, the CCC, DSC, and the node perspective. Um, so this slide talks about the composition of the lead team. And then um, the second bullet really speaks to the fact that we're going to be focusing on um, the node aspect from Frankie Kropp's experience, Clinical Coordinating Center from my experience, and then um, Colleen will be speaking from the Data and Statistics Center perspective. So then when you actually look at the components of multi-site trials, we really break it into multiple different um, focus groups focus areas, and so um, when we look at this, we're going to talk about really the development of the idea of the protocol and getting it into um, a concept that gets then submitted and, and gets um, to CCTN, to the Research Development Committee, and then gets approved and then gets a number assigned and becomes uh, a protocol. And then we're going to talk through trial development and logistics the steps that are involved in that, as well as uh, the data management meeting that occurs, and I'll show you all of this on a timeline in a minute. The national training that we've done recently this fall uh, remotely, but we also have done it in, as investigator meetings in person. So, it, And sometimes it's done as a combination of both. And then finally, um, study start, which is what we're all aiming, aiming for. So if we look at the timeline here, um, when you look at the development part, this is the concept approval, the number gets assigned, um, the initial budget um, gets developed, and this is really an overall budget, and then it gets revised all along the way. And then you really do also develop an initial timeline that's probably fairly rough, and then it becomes more detailed the further we get towards study start. The protocol approval um, portion of this timeline really involves PRB if, if this protocol does go to a, a protocol review board, DSMB that follows that. Um, the lead node typically then uh, submits the protocol to the IRB, and then their site selection activities occur during this time, as well as um, some other regulatory submissions, which may be um, working on the certificate of confidentiality and, and other, other items that may be needed for the study. Then we moved to the trial development and logistics, and this is really hammering out all of the details of the study. So a lot of the study documents are developed here, and we're going to go into some detail on that. ECRFs that are involved in the um, data capture system, the operations manual, QA plan, SOPs, all of that. We work on training, um, developing the training and the planning for the study. We work, uh, especially here at the CCC, on the study medications. Uh, laboratory assessments that are done, any other types of supplies or contracts for ECGs or for any other type of testing or assessments that are needed to support the study. And usually during this time also the sites may submit for IRB approval um, to try to get it going relatively early in the process. And then about six to eight weeks before the national training, um, we do kind of final CRF um, revisions at this data management meeting. We're looking at a lot of different details of the protocol. And actually what we do find most of the time at these meetings is there are some changes and updates that happen not only to the protocol but also to the ops manuals and other things as we really start to um, lock things down. We find that some adjustments are needed. Um, and a lot of times during this time frame, the sites are starting to hire their staff. And then if we move to the national training, that's usually about four weeks before study starts. Sometimes it's uh, even closer. Um, the training documentation form gets finalized. Delegation law gets finalized. Um, regulatory training occurs then and, and um, getting all the different documents submitted into the RTS system, document collection. And then uh, supplies and meds a lot of times get to the sites um, either just before national training or just after. 
And then what we do at that point is start to plan the monitoring visits, which may be both QA and the CCC initiation visits. The, uh, once those initiation visits occur and reports happen, their endorsements and then starting enrollment. So that's a thumbnail sketch of all that occurs from you know the beginning concept to getting sites endorsed and getting them going. So we'll talk about that in some more detail. And at this point, um, oops, I am passing this off to Frankie. That's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, th this is uh, that's right where I'm going. Uh, thank you, Eve. So as we get into the nuts and bolts of this whole process. Um, we want to begin by looking at the study timeline because from the very beginning, as soon as you have uh, notification that you are actually moving forward, one of the first things that you want to begin doing is putting together what you have as a projected timeline. What we see here on the screen is a particular uh, tool that's available to you in the CTN Investigator tool, the Toolbox. There also is a revised and an automated tool available that we will look at shortly. But as soon as the concept has been approved, we'll be given a, a CTN study number, and then at that point, the lead team is responsible for preparing the study timeline and submitting it to the CTN for approval. Um, when we're looking at the timeline that we want to develop up front, we really want to begin thinking about these distinct phases that Eve just uh, put forth on the, on the timeline slide a couple of slides back. We want to look at protocol development. We want to look at trial preparation. Um, we want to look at uh, moving into the trial. And then once the trial is going, we want to look at the conduct of the trial and the publication plan as well when we're thinking about the timeline. So you really do want to begin at the very beginning. You're already thinking about the end process. And I think that um, is a, a really critical point to drive home here is that while the pre-implementation phases um, involve a lot of energy and a lot of information and a lot of work, we can't lose sight of what our end goal is way on down the line. So including things like, you know, how are we going to analyze the data? What kinds of publications, what kinds of products would we like to see come out of, of this trial? We want to keep that in mind up front as much as possible. So let's move into the development phase. And in addition to answering the scientific question, the protocol development has got to take into account a, a large number of things. All of these things impact the budget, and all of these things are needed to, to clarify in order to begin framing out the procedures that we're going to need in order to answer that scientific question. So some of those things, as you see uh, in the right-hand column there, are the cost-benefit ratio, excuse me, <coughs> for each study procedure. And what I mean by that <coughs> is that in developing the protocol, we might look at what is the ideal methods that we would like to use for putting, putting this protocol together. So in order to obtain the information on the scientific question, Maybe ideally we would like to be able to do some neuroimaging, maybe we would like to do several blood draws, maybe we would like to use contingency management. So there are a wide variety of things that ideally we would like to look at in terms of our um, answering our scientific question. But then the ideal world butts up against the real world and we have to say, what can we actually afford? And you have to keep in mind that each study procedure bears a cost. Uh, it might be the cost of the procedure itself. Uh, it might just be the cost of staff time that's involved in implementing that procedure. And so all of that needs to be taken into consideration. 
You want to think about the expected rate of recruitment for your target end because that's going to tell you how long um, calendar-wise you're looking at uh, implementing the trial. You're also going to want to know how many sites are going to be required to reach that target end. And, and again, the rate of recruitment comes into play there. And all of these things are your beginnings of really hammering out the budget. You have the impact of inclusion and exclusion criteria on recruitment. Um, it is not at all unusual to say, well, gee, we would really like to uh, make this a pretty exclusive trial. And then you begin thinking about in the sites that are available to us, is that a reasonable thing to expect that we're going to get, for example, a pure uh, person who is, has cocaine dependence? Uh, chance, you know, and has no other mental health or physical health disorders or any other substance use disorders. Chances are good you're not going to find too many of those folks. And so you have to, again, play this balancing game of what's ideal versus what's, what's reality. And then we also have to think about potential safety issues and how they're going to be managed. And I have to say, in my years at the CTN, things are much more flexible now than they were up front. Uh, when we started CTN 13, which was the first trial for which we were the national um, you know, lead on, uh, we made the determination, because we were working with pregnant women, that women who were going into the hospital in order to deliver a baby uh, that was a, an uncomplicated um, delivery would not be considered as a serious adverse event. Up to that point, uh, the the trials in the CTN put a used a, a pretty clear cut um, list of the FDA standards for uh, what is what constitutes a serious adverse event, and that was one of the first times that we ever thought about well maybe we can make this flexible. So you want to think about. Um, particularly if you're operating in a psychosocial trial, are you going to include medical adverse events? Are you going to include medical um, adverse events as including things like psychiatric problems? So these are all some questions that have to be decided up front because that's going to impact your ability to uh, recruit, and it also might impact your choice of sites. Moving on down in the left column, uh, now we're really going to begin thinking critically about developing our budget. And again, it begins very early in the project protocol development stage, and it's updated at each stage along the way. You may find that you have, have to make several iterations of your budget in order to develop a protocol that's financially feasible, and you're going to have to actually investigate the cost of the interventions and assessments so that you can make reasonable comparisons. So, for example, if you would like to use uh, a particular blood test that requires a particular um, kind of processing up front, like we did in 31A, when we did 31A, that was a very uh, delicate blood assay that was performed in that study, and we had to go and actually do some um, digging around to find out just how much did that comet assay cost, what, what was involved, what was the preparation, and, and it involved actually buying a very particular kind of centrifuge for that study. So those are the kinds of things that you have to be thinking about up front, even, even before you have your operations manual and your procedures set in stone. When you think about your protocol concept submission, the one that you're, you're turning into um, the CCTN, that actually should be accompanied by an initial budget that, that contains as complete as information as possible. And that might include um, budget information that's both study-wide and specific to a node or a site that might be participating. Uh, what do you anticipate the personnel over co overall cost to be, as well as how many man hours or FTEs uh, per study role do you think are going to be required for this study? Um, for your major supplies and equipment, what are the costs that are associated with those supplies and equipment? 
And what about participant reimbursements and things like contingency management, as well as advertising and recruitment costs, and last but not least, travel that's going to be um, required in order to achieve uh, site visits by your node project manager or QA staff. And I think at this point, I'd just like to turn it over to Eve and Colleen to talk about this from the CCC and DSC perspective. Okay. Thank you, Frankie. Um, so in this development stage, uh, a lot of what the CCC is involved in with the lead node is, is kind of early planning. So what we'll be involved in is really kind of talking with the lead node and, and their team about kind of dividing up the responsibilities. Who's going? And some for teams that have done this before, they know most of that. For teams that are brand new or haven't really led a protocol before, then you know we do a lot more. Some informal discussions offline, and then some during our um, kind of development calls, uh, weekly development calls. And sometimes they're weekly, sometimes they're biweekly. It just depends on where we are in the process. But we'll talk about um, some things that are involved in the study. It may be supplies that may be study medication so that we can start to research the costs involved. Um, we also, you know, will be talking about um, whether some things, uh, whether some supplies may be provided like computers provided by the lead node or something might be uh, provided by the local node and or purchased by the sites or purchased by the CCC kept at our central pharmacy or our central warehouse and sent out during the life of the study. So a lot of those things start to be discussed at this time point. Um, we really consult with the whole lead team, CCTN, CCC, DSC, and the lead node on uh, really having a lot of us understand what's the concept behind the protocol, you know, as far as primary outcome, what are the either lab assessments or other other assessments that are going on that we really need to have centralized versus what things are going to be done locally. Um, and so that's where we really investigate some of the study needs, um, discussing specific medication, whether we're packaging things or we're sending a bottle of bulk supply of, of pills or of film or of tablets or a, a blister cards to the sites, whether things are blinded or not. Um, and as I said here, laboratory assessments, ECGs, anything else. And so a lot of this is involved in, in the budgeting discussions and in kind of cost allocation. And a lot of these items also are helpful to start to put on your timeline so that if we know we're going to need medication, you get working on it as soon as you can so that everything involving contracts and packaging and, and getting it out to the sites can occur you know, prior to or during the national training. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of it is, is communication, asking questions, having some frank discussions, understanding if something is a nice to know versus a need to know for the study, and then trying to allocate who, who's really going to be responsible for making that happen. And I guess I'll pass to Colleen for DSC now. So early in the protocol development process, we want to think um, critically about the types of assessments that will be performed on the study, and what types of data we're going to collect and report. Um, as Frankie mentioned earlier, you have to balance the number of assessments that are being done with budget considerations, time considerations, and other factors. And it's important to do that early while you're nailing down the details of the protocol. We've had occasions uh, in the past where there are too many assessments um, scheduled at a particular visit, and it ends up taking twice as long to perform those assessments as was planned, and then that has implications on how long a participant's at a visit, how much research time is being spent on collecting those assessments. Uh, so evaluating early what type of assessments need to be done. One of the first things that I do when I get um, a protocol is I take a look at the schedule of assessments uh, usually there's a nice table in the protocol, and I go through each of those assessments and ask myself the question of, is this assessment being collected to evaluate a study endpoint, to look at adherence with the protocol, or to measure safety? And if it doesn't meet one of those three 
uh, criteria, then I usually ask, why are we doing this assessment? Why is it important? Um, and I think that's a good exercise to do to look at making sure that the assessments that are being done are really important ones. And then early in the process, as the assessments are nailed down, uh, we start to think about what types of case report forms we want to develop and begin to gather the requirements and specifications for those forms. Um, as the DSC, we can provide examples of case report forms that have been used on prior studies. Um, we can encourage the use of certain um, assessments. For example, if a study is interested in measuring quality of life, we can give the examples of certain types of quality of life assessments that have been done on other protocols. And the use of standard forms and standard assessments can help to streamline and expedite um, not only the database development process, but the entire uh, study development process. And I'll turn it over to Frankie. Thanks, Colleen. So moving into the protocol approval phase, this is, as, as Eve mentioned before, this is really the phase where you begin honing in on what your final protocol will involve. Um, you may be reviewed through the protocol review board, the DSMB. Um, definitely, you are going to be going through your lead node IRB um, or, or some central IRB, uh, if that's the case. Uh, and all each one of those steps, there's likely to be some tweaks that occur to your to your protocol. So throughout the process, just going back to this issue of the study budget, as you make those tweaks, you want to make sure that you're updating your study budget throughout this approval process based on what what feedback comes back to you uh, from these various boards. As you are um, getting closer and closer to receiving approval. Now you're going to begin really honing in from a budgetary perspective on things like the number of man hours and the target staff for each procedure. Um, now is when you're going to begin to negotiate with the CCC in regards to what they will be providing versus what the sites will be providing. Uh, and in some cases versus what the lead node will be providing from a budgetary perspective. And I think one piece that is really critical to begin at this point, uh, if you haven't thought about that already, is from the lead node's perspective, what kind of lead node do you want to be? Uh, now here at the Ohio Valley Node, we're extremely hands-on and uh, we uh, are ex you know, extremely active in the whole process of ensuring that the development of the materials and the, the finalization of forms and that sort of thing. But I realize that not all nodes are like that. More nodes, some nodes might be more comfortable having the CCC take a stronger hand on those sorts of things. So I think it's really important at this, at this stage of the game to determine as a group what kind of lead node do you want to be. How, how active, how involved do you want to be? How involved do you want to be in terms of making some final decisions? And then you need to begin at this point to communicate back and forth with the CCC and the DSC around those areas where uh, you would like them to take a stronger stance and areas where you're going to ask to take the stronger stance. Ultimately, that kind of, that level of communication is critical to make sure that things later on down the road don't get dropped through the cracks. So once the concept is approved, the lead team, and I'm just going to kind of generalize that because it may be the lead node, it may be the CCC and the DSC, or it may be some combination of the two, are going to begin initial work on the operations manual, the trial performance management or QA plan, the training plan, the development of CRFs, um, all of these things really need to occur up front because when you go to submit to your, to your initial submission at your IRB as the lead node, you need to have all of these elements in place depending on what your, your IRB requires. So, um, you know, begin 
beginning to think about designing those CRS. Who's going to design the CRS? Here in the Ohio Valley Node, we design all our own CRS first on paper and then work with the DSC to um, adjust those as needed to fit the, uh, e the eData system. We want to think about, at this point, uh, what kind of training we're going to plan. And it seems really early on, but it takes a long, long time to plan out a national training, months and months and months. And so uh, you may, if there's a face-to-face -face training planned, you as the lead node may need to begin working with the NIDA logistics contractors who currently is Synergy uh, in order to procure the venue and the attendee lodging. Um, and in some cases, like we had in 46, you might get a surprise. So it's important that even if you have contractors that you anticipate are going to start working on these, one of the things that happened to us in 46 was that we anticipated that Synergy was going to help and then kind of at the last minute, we learned that there wasn't enough money in the Synergy budget for that year in order for them to take that on. And then we as a lead node had to kind of scramble and make that happen. So it, it's really critical that even if you were working with the contractor, um, that you maintain an active hand in that, just in case. And so together, the lead node, the CCC, um, and NIDA will need to determine what other kinds of things might be needed. So, for example, regulatory things, additional regulatory requirements might include an investigational new drug application or exemption, a certificate of confidentiality. That's obtained for almost every one of our CTN studies. You might find that you need to get OHRP prisoner certification um, or some other kind of study-specific regulatory requirement, like an exemption from obtaining informed consent or uh, an investigational device. And in the case of um, working with other cultures, so for example, I've worked on a couple of studies with American Indians, and that required its own set of regulatory requirements. And currently, we have some international studies happening in China, uh, with sites in China and sites in, in Canada. And there may be additional regulatory requirements that are involved uh, because of the different uh, nations that are involved. So lots of things to think about here. The lead node should coordinate with the CCC to determine which IRB or IRBs are going to be used, whether it will be a centralized IRB or specific institutional IRBs and what other additional regulatory bodies might have to come into play here, like the VA or um, a state-level research regulatory requirement or some local research regulatory requirement. Or, as I said, in the case of uh, working with the tribal nations, we, in, in many cases, had to involve the Indian Health Service. So by the time you get to your lead node IRB submission, you really need it to be as complete as possible so that once you receive your approval, you'll be able to hand that off to the site so that they can begin their regulatory process. And that means that not just the protocol, but also your consent, your consent comprehension tool, CRF, source docs that the participant will see, pre-screens, locator forms, recruitment documents, retention documents, all of that stuff you want is uh, to give your lead note IRB as complete a package as you possibly can for this initial submission. So as you're thinking about all of this different stuff and how that impacts uh, not just the timeline but also the budget, I wanted to call to your attention a template that is, again, available to you in the CTN Investigator Toolbox. And this is a template that was designed here at the Ohio Valley Node by our Node Coordinator, Angela Casey Willingham, along with input from uh, Matthew Elmore and, and Dr. Teresa Winhusen, who's our PI. And this, uh, what you're seeing here is the summary sheet, and I just want to draw your attention to it. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but this particular instrument provides sheets for determining costs for the lead node, for the participating RRTCs, 
for the participating CTPs. And then you have this summary sheet that pulls totals from the other sheets and uh, both auto-tabulates and auto-feeds them using links. This allows you to use this tool for real-time adjustments in your budget as you are changing different um, procedures based on what, what feedback you're receiving from the various uh, regulatory bodies. The other thing that this allows you to do is, as we've been talking about, paring down your protocol so that it's actually doable financially. So you can plug in your ideal, look at the bottom line and say, wow, is that too much? And then you can play with the numbers and, and uh, they will update for you automatically so you can in, in very real time make adjustments to your procedures and see what, what that turns out to be from a financial perspective. Um, just one note of caution, if you, if you go to use this before you enter anything in a cell, hover over that cell and see if it has a formula. If it has a formula, don't enter it there. Enter it somewhere else. So once you have, have your, your protocol and uh, it's all pretty established and, and you've gone on and are ready to begin the, the site selection process, that's really your next step. Um, I, I would want to encourage you all to document uh, very thoroughly your process for site selection that will help you understand why you selected the sites you did eventually. And it also is just a nice historical record for future reference. Um, you need to determine and document your process uh, for selecting the sites in terms of things like, are you going to target certain sites? Maybe there are certain sites that you've worked with before or sites that you know have a certain population that you're looking for. Or are you going to give an open call, kind of an everyone come uh, to the CTN at large and then kind of see what, what you get? When you go to um, determine which sites to select, how many stages of, of site selection are you going to go through? How many rounds of questionnaires are you going to use? Are you going to have on-site visits? Or are you only going to use remote visits? Or are you going to have a combination of the two? The, the one thing that you really want to do before you start this process is to clearly establish your site criteria. Then you want to develop one or more stages of your survey documents, and then you're going to maintain the track, a, a, a tracking of your survey results. Once you um, are ready to go, then you want to provide the potential sites with at least a, a rough estimate of the budget. Um, by now, at this point, you should have a pretty good estimate of what your budget is going to be. No, perhaps it's not the final budget, but you should have a, a pretty good sense of, of things so that when, let's say, for example, I give a, a study budget of $500,000 for a three-year study, uh, to potential sites, they can tell me whether or not that's even going to be doable for them. So you're going to look at your sites. You're going to rank them based on your site criteria. Um, you're going to have calls to talk about any questions. Uh, you may have a visit. And the final piece of this is that you're going to present your final sites to the executive committee for their and NIDA's approval. And then once approved, uh, you're going to inform them of their selection. You're going to provide them with materials that will allow them to finalize a site-specific study budget. So at this point, let me turn this back over to Eve and to Colleen to talk about the protocol approval process from their perspective. Okie doke. Um, to continue with Frankie's thoughts on the site selection process, the CCC can be supportive in this, um, in kind of your quest of finding the, the best sites for your particular study. Part of that is, you know, 
with the lead team having discussions about the site criteria and coming up with, you know, really what are the what are the requirements that the sites need to have both personnel and um, popula study population as well as um, uh, facilities. You know, they need to have particular, whether it's a residential or outpatient or whatever facility is needed for recruitment. Um, another aspect that the CCC can do in supporting that is some teams have chosen to do, if they do an open call or even if they do a limited selection uh, or a limited um, offer of a study to sites, the CCC can collect the data and put it into a table if the um, selection, site selection committee wants to do it in a more blinded or anonymous uh, manner. So there are different ways to do it. Some folks want to do it where it's wide open and everybody knows what sites have what criteria, and other groups would like to do it uh, in an anonymous manner. So that, that's one way that we can help to support that. Um, and deciding on the, on the criteria is, is really important as well. Um, during this phase, there, as Frankie was discussing, there really is more finalization or revisions of the budget going on and of the timeline. Um, and one really important thing to do at this time point also is as, as the lead team, as the whole group uh, really starts to get this protocol finalized, is really talk through right from um, recruitment and screening right through to the various stages of the study, what walk the participants through that so that there's a real discussion of, um, you know, is there direct data entry versus source documents? Um, what will the CCC be looking at during monitoring visits? I mean, we look at that a lot more closely at the data management meeting later, but it really helps to have an idea of that early on here. And it also helps the team determine whether we really need to get cranking on developing source documents that will be used um, by the sites. Um, we usually talk um, in more detail about um, medication management and how we're going to track that. Uh, we talk in detail about um, information about monitoring and uh, whether we do all on-site monitoring, if there's going to be any remote monitoring. Um, with some studies, we do a remote initiation visit, uh, especially where study drug is not involved, and then we go out right away once that first participant gets enrolled and randomized, or randomized depending on the study, and we um, then get out immediately to help uh, you know, just see that first patient through the study and see if all all the processes that have been discussed uh, by phone and um, and in some cases at the initiation visit, if everything is being followed through appropriately. And because we really want to get the sites doing, um, making sure that they follow the processes that have been put in place, that they're all doing it relatively consistently across all the sites so that uh, the study is being conducted really following the protocol. And so there are less deviations uh, from the protocol, less issues later in having to explain in the paper after the fact that, well, this site did it this way and this site did it this way, which sometimes starts to affect your study data and have, have problems with that. Um, we also start to really, in detail, talk about the training plans. Um, sometimes it's general discussion, and then it really starts getting into the nuts and bolts of how are we going to do the training. Um, and then we talk about uh, what are the risks with the study? What are some of the problems that can come up um, uh, either during um, screening, during the initial um, enrollment, uh, where, or, or actually during the implementation of the study? What risks are involved? Um, how can we put steps in place? I mean, in some, some cases it's uh, having informed consent signed. So, when we have issues with that, sometimes sites have a second person before that study participant even leaves the site. They have a second person who on the, on the study team go through the documents that have been filled in during that visit just to make sure that everything has been completed in an appropriate manner. So there are lots of ways that you can um, look at risks and look and look at previous studies where there have been issues and try to not have those issues occur on, on current studies. Um, and then we also talk about, uh, discuss and confirm specific regulatory requirements, whether, you know, is it an IND study? So are we doing submissions to the FDA versus are we, um, 
you know, using 1572s versus is this uh, a non-IND study where we're using the investigator agreements and we don't have to submit items to the FDA. Um, getting a COC in place, and that happens on about 99% of the CTN trials. Um, and also, is this study set up in such a place where we need the OHARP uh, prisoner certification in place because either it's residential or because some of the states involved may have fairly lax definitions of what a quote unquote prisoner is. It may be someone who's on parole. And, you know, what do the sites have to do to, to determine whether someone is a prisoner or not? Um, and DEA certificates if some of the study medication is, um, is scheduled. So there are just a lot of uh, details that we have to talk through at this stage, but um, it helps us do a better job later if we start to really work it out then. And now time for Colleen. So once we have the protocol pretty well formed, we'll immediately begin development and programming of the electronic case report forms. And we'll do that based on requirements and specifications that are provided to us um, often by the lead node. And they can come in a variety of different formats. As Frankie mentioned, uh, her team has taken pro an approach of um, developing very thorough Word documents of the case report forms first. For other teams that we have worked with, they may say, here's an example of a form we used on a previous study, or we would like to use form X from study A and form Y from study B. Uh, and then others have provided us with spreadsheets of the specifications, and any format uh, works well for us. We view this as an iterative process, so as we have a draft of a CRF developed, we'll immediately share that with the team for review and input. And we want to get a lot of input during the draft and development phase to ensure that everyone's needs are being met. We don't want to get to the point where we have a fully developed data system, and then we show it to the group, and we realize that our assumptions about how the forms should look and how the system should work um, don't meet the expectations of others in the group. And so there's a lot of back and forth via conference calls and via email to make sure that we understand the requirements and that we're meeting the needs of the team. As Eve mentioned, as we're developing the data system, we really want to think about what the planned study workflow is. And so this is why it's really important to start to develop your operations manual very early in the uh, development process. And you want to think about things like how are the data going to be collected? Will they be entered directly into the EDC system? Will they be collected on paper first? Or are they going to be entered by a participant? And some of those decisions will drive how the form looks and how we set up certain features of the data system. Um, in addition, you want to really think through all of the steps from the time a person is consented until their very last visit on the study and, and how that person flows through the study. So, for example, um, often a protocol may have everything lumped into a screening category. And then the operations manual may go into more detail and say that that screening occurs over one day or it occurs over three days. And so if you haven't thought through that, you may not know if the screening is going to occur over three days, do you repeat certain assessments over those three days? And if so, do we need to collect the data from the repeats of those assessments in the data system? Or is the screening just occurring on one day, all the assessments are done once and entered once into the data system? And so thinking through those little details um, and the logistics of the study can really help you to make sure that you have designed your data system to really facilitate the collection of the data from the assessments that you're performing. Okay, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to Frankie. Thank you, Colleen. So by now, your head may be spinning going, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to keep track of all this stuff? And I want to, again, turn your attention to a tool that's available to you on the CTN Investigator Toolbox. This is also a timeline um, tool for you. This was developed by Dr. Teresa Winhusen here at the Ohio Valley Node. And this is a much more detailed version of uh, the timeline. And I'm, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through it in, you know, very thoroughly. But I just wanted you to know that, that there's a column for the specific task that needs to be completed. 
There's a column that tells you what are the prerequisites for completion of that task. There's an estimated date by which the prerequisite should be complete and an estimated time, the amount of time that it should take you to complete the task. And then that will calculate for you the target date of completion for that. Once you enter the actual date completed, um, then other things will, will auto-populate uh, that depend upon that particular piece that's just been completed. And then a nice little tickler on the far right is um, this column will ideally remain blank, but if a critical task experiences a significant delay, the cell will turn red and display a red X to alert you to the fact that there is a problem that has the potential to impact your date of site initiation. So this has uh, very specific uh, um, instructions available with it, and again, they're on the investigator toolbox. Let's give our presenters a chance to come up for air and break for questions. So, Maisha, can we open to take any questions that we have so far? Um, so, the instructions for that would be to um, have each of the participants that would like to ask a question or even to just chime in for um, a comment to press star one and the operator will announce your name, your first and or last name. So press star one. And I do not believe we have any questions. Maisha, uh, can you confirm that please? There. So um, if you have any questions, I'm going to ask you to put it in Q&A um, and type it in, and I will allow the presenters to go ahead and continue with the presentation. And uh, we really would like to hear from you, so please don't be shy, uh, because uh, we, we do studies all the time, and we really would like to encourage everyone to participate. Um, I know you have your own experiences to share as well. So we'll, um, if there are any questions in the Q&A speakers, I'll go ahead and sort of uh, chime in or let you know, but we can go ahead and proceed. Okay, great. Thank you, Tracy. So let's move on now to the next phase, and that is the trial development and logistics phase. And you may be thinking, well, gosh, didn't we just talk about a whole ton of logistics? Um, yes, we did. And now we're going to talk about more because that really is the name of the game as you're preparing for a trial, is every little footstep that uh, needs to be considered must be considered in detail all along the way. So whether we're talking about the budget or whether we're talking about the patient experience as they go through the trial or whether we're talking about the logistics that of how are we going to actually implement this uh, procedure or that procedure? All of these things need to be considered at, in increasing detail at every step of the way. So again, as we, um, oops, as we consider uh, the trial development and logistics piece, I, I pose the question to you again, what kind of lead node do you want to be? Uh, by now, uh, you should be coordinating very, very closely with both the CCC and the DSC in order to prepare the final draft of the study guidance documents, so things like the operations manual and the QA, uh, as well as the final draft for the study management tools like the study logs, the checklists, progress reports, report templates, other kinds of miscellaneous management tools. Um, the reason that you want to have very, very close communication at this point and have your roles clearly defined as to who's responsible for what is that this is the point at which it's really easy for the details to, to fall through the cracks. And so you want to make sure that it's, it's very clear um, if we're talking about who is going to find out about 
uh, how much a, a, a centrifuge costs and what's the best model, that you have that person identified, that you don't suddenly find yourself preparing to give a, a submission packet uh, to the sites that includes their budget and suddenly you don't know how much their, their centrifuge is going to cost them. Um, so you may need to leave space or some vague references to some of the items, uh, particularly thinking about the operations manual, uh, things that cannot be finalized now. And the reason for this is that you want to have these items in as close to, to their final form as possible at this point because these are the materials that you are now going to give to your selected sites um, in order for them to begin their regulatory process. The more details and, and things you can finalize and hammer out now, uh, the more you'll be able to avoid having multiple amendments later. And, and we all know that IRBs just really don't like those. We want to coordinate with the CCC and the DSC to develop all of the training stuff, the training plans, the training materials, not necessarily developing the slides at this point, uh, but thinking about what do we want to cover and how are we going to cover it? Um, are we going to cover, you know, what piece of it is going to be covered remotely? What piece of it is going to be covered by a, uh, a narrated PowerPoint presentation that we send to the sites in advance? Um, how much of this is going to uh, be in a, a lecture format and how much of this is going to be in an experiential format? All of those little details now start getting hammered out. By this time, we should have a sense of when the national training will occur so that we can begin to develop the training announcements. Now, at this point, we don't want to post this stuff yet because, you know, things might change and we don't want to prematurely um, confuse the sites. But by now, we should have, have developed a pretty good plan um, as to what our training plan and, and the, the details of that look like. And just as a comment, as, as someone who's done training for a long time, you could actually do a whole webinar just on this piece. There's uh, so much to think about when you're preparing um, the, the national training package for a, a new study. Um, it really can be overwhelming. So lots to think about here. Once you, have, as the lead node, have received approval of your regulatory submission materials, then you're going to turn around and provide those uh, approved submission materials to the sites. And you want to make sure that everybody's communicating clearly. So you might email them to the sites. There's no problem with that. But to have the clearest communication, you want to make sure that you are posting the approved submission packet on LiveLink and that you instruct the sites that that's the packet that they need to make sure goes to their IRBs. Depending on your, your role as the lead node, you may or may not want to get more involved in the details of, you know, approving uh, site-specific modifications to formatting that come from various IRB requirements. I know that some studies um, actually want to see your informed consent before you put it into your IRB, while as others say, as long as you don't change the content uh, significantly, you know, do what you have to do in order for your site uh, to be approved by your IRB. But all of this really, you know, what you, how you're going to approach this all needs to be uh, set up ahead of time so that you're not caught off guard when the participating sites have questions. The other, the other thing that you want to do at this point is you want to develop, either the lead node develops this or it might be developed by the CCC or, or some combination of that. Um, you want to provide your sites with a pre-initiation checklist to help them track movement towards site initiation. This checklist should mimic the site, um, uh, site initiation visit report, uh, so looking at the same kinds of things. But this checklist is probably going to be a lot more detailed. So instead of just saying, yes, all of our staff are in place, um, 
your site uh, pre-initiation checklist might actually say, okay, you're going to need a PI. Who is that? When were they hired? You're going to need, you know, four RAs or two nurses or whatever. Um, but allowing the sites to to track detail by detail uh, what they're going to need in order to prepare for this um, for their site initiation visit. And then at this point, uh, your lead team may wish to begin holding pre-initiation site teleconferences. They might be national or they might be site-specific. And if they're national teleconferences, one of the things, again, in your budget to think about is who's going to pay because there's a cost involved with hosting a multi-line um, conference uh, on, on a telephone. Is it going to be through Skype? Is it going to be through, you know, something like we're on now? Um, how are you going to go about doing that? So, again, just those details that you want to make sure that you're thinking about as you begin um, finalizing these last uh, elements of the trial. And so at this point, let me go ahead and turn it back over to Eve and Colleen. Okie doke. So um, a lot of what the CCC doing, is doing at this point in time with, um, with the lead node and with the rest of the lead team is, is a lot of what Frankie already discussed. So we're really working on finalizing documents. A lot of it is the uh, operations manual. Um, if we're looking at SOPs, it may be SOPs that the sites um, are needing to have that are study-wide, or it may be a site-specific SOP for this study where they're not going to do exactly what the lead node has in place. And I bring that up just because I know a lot of times as we get to doing study initiation, sometimes those site SOPs are what end up holding things up or being able to provide them to the lead node and to the CCC ahead of time prior to the initiation visit um, is, is a good thing to have in place. So for those of you that are sites or, or nodes of local, covering local sites, that you can help, uh, help make sure that those SOPs don't get overlooked or lost in the mix. Um, the management tools we're looking at as far as um, uh, any different uh, types of source documents or medication tracking logs or any of the types of things that are going to be used throughout the implementation phase of the study. Um, we at that point also at the CCC are finalizing any laboratory, any consultant or vendor contracts for the ECG machines, for um, any specific equipment that may be needed on site that we're involved in. Um, there also is a um, relatively new delegation of authority and signature log that we've put in place for some of our newer studies. So the CCC, DSC, and the lead node will be discussing that as far as um, who needs what training to be in what role for that particular study. Um, and then we'll also start to have calls with the sites going through those pre-initiation checklists just to make sure that they're getting close and ready to go uh, so that come um, national training, we can actually get out to the sites and start to do some of the um, initiation visits, and, and we won't have a list of 20 action items after the visit. Um, and then also once the uh, lead node has received their initial IRB approval, uh, we'll start to collect some of the protocol-wide regulatory documents in RTS here at, at the regulatory track, tracking system here at uh, the CCC, and then we'll, we'll get to site specific regulatory documents uh, around national training and, and uh, after that. Uh, and that's, um, that's pretty much, I mean, the, we were talking about training and we'll also work on the training documentation form and really get that finalized during this time frame as well. So I guess I will pass it now to Colleen. At this stage, we are spending a good bit of our effort completing and finalizing the development of the case report forms and the electronic data capture system for the study. And the time frame that we are working towards is hosting a data management meeting here at MS, which I'll talk a little bit um, about in a few minutes. Uh, but the goal is to have that meeting about 
six to eight weeks prior to the national training meeting. And so what we're working towards is having a good version of the EDC system and the ECRFs ready by the time of that meeting. So again, we're having frequent calls and emails and communication with the other members of the lead team to understand the requirements for data collection for the study. We can also start to begin the Advantage EDC User's Guide and CRF Manual, the Global Trace User's Guide, as well as the Advantage EDC Practicum. And we work with uh, other members of the lead team for the development of these documents, um, particularly the EDC User's Guide and CRF Manual. We tend to handle the development of the more technical components of that guide and manual, and then work with the lead node or other experts on the particular assessments and CRFs to provide um, more subject matter uh, guidance on how to perform the assessments and collect the data for those assessments. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Frankie to transition into the timing for the data management meeting. Colleen? Frankie, are you there? Yes. Great. You can get started. Okay. Lots of little surprises today. Oops. Sorry. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about uh, the lead node perspective on the data management meeting. I think Colleen will be talking a lot more in detail about this. I think the point that I really want to make here is that this is a time when, as the lead node, you need to really be in heavy communication and negotiation with the CCC and the DSC in order to accurately translate um, your data needs for the study into the electronic database. That's going to require you to look at, at what's been developed uh, with a fine-tooth comb. If you're not the person who's good at that, find someone on your staff that is. We have a fellow here named Jeff who uh, we affectionately refer to as Eagle Eyes because he can really pick out um, the smallest detail that needs to be adjusted or fixed um, and we, uh, you know, work together with the DSC to make sure that the database, database looks and functions the way we want it to look and function. I think the other piece to, to talk about here as we talk about finalizing these study documents and tools um, is that we really want things to be in their final form um, as, as closely as as, as quickly as possible following the data management meeting. Um, we really don't want to have a situation where uh, we're confusing the teams by continually issuing changes to documents that they have already received. So, you know, just thinking about how to implement any changes that occur, when, what's the timing of that. At this point, we're going to provide the training plan and the training documentation form to the sites. Again, I recommend putting that on live link. And our lead node monitors, uh, our, our, our lead node is going to begin monitoring the site progress toward their initiation weekly. And so let me, again, pass this back to Eve and Colleen. Okay, so at the data management meeting, uh, typically at this meeting, the, the PI, the project director, um, and then usually several, several other people from the project team are here. And um, the CCC, I mean, it's, it's really a DSC meeting, and the CCC is a guest there and really trying to get a handle on um, really form by form, what are we looking at, what date, the monitors actually from the CCC attend this meeting as well as the protocol specialist, as well as some of the CCC management and the, the CCC safety uh, monitor. So that we really have the team there who can look at, you know, what sort of documents are we looking at, um, how can we verify that data, if it's direct data entry, is there anything that we need in the study participants binder on site that will 
help us with, with verifying the data if we need to verify it or not. And that way, we make sure that the CCC and the lead node and the DSC, we all understand where data is coming from. Um, because in the past, we've had some situations where later on in the study, everyone thought everything else, things were being done differently. And we realized that this is really a critical time point where we can verify that what we're planning on looking at on site or remotely through monitoring, um, as well as just how the study is being followed and the protocol being followed, that, that all the steps, that we understand the steps so that we can make sure when we're on site that the processes are being followed. Um, so, you know, we're looking very, very closely at the operations manual with the CRF with the protocol, and so that's where we're really integrating those three key documents uh, all together, uh, and then identifying the source documents, finalizing any guidance, and usually at this meeting there may be some changes either to the protocol or the CRS and or um, the operations manual as a result of that. But really the aim is to, at the end of this meeting, get as close as we can to finalizing all study guidance uh, documents and management tools so that we're really ready to go. Um, and then also this is a time where we're really close to finalizing all training plans and really getting the agendas down as to what's happening at the investigator meeting if it's in person, what may happen by rep webinar, uh, or you know what's remote, what's in person. Um, and then the, I'm going to pass to Colleen to talk about the, per, the, the DSC portion of the data management meeting. As Frankie and Eve have noted, the goal of this meeting is to really go form by form within the data system and critically review the case report forms. And I go back to one of the original slides that we had where we're looking at those forms and asking the questions of, is this being used to assess study endpoints? Is this being used to assess adherence and compliance with the protocol? And is this being used? is this being used to assess study safety? And if it doesn't meet one of those um, three criteria, then we ask, what are we, what are we using the CRF for? What are we using these data for? Um, and so really critically reviewing the CRF and what we want to do is identify any final changes to the CRF at this meeting so that we have sufficient time to implement those changes prior to the national training meeting. Ideally, we don't want to make any modifications to the CRS or the data system after the national training meeting and after the study starts up. Uh, we want to have consistent data collection throughout the duration of the study. Um, the meetings where this has gone most smoothly have been those where the operations manual and some of the other study documents and manuals have been developed very early in this timeline. And so we get to the point of the data management meeting where we're very clear on operationally how the study will work, and that translates into very clear on the requirements and the functionality of the case report forms. And then we'll also at this meeting start to introduce and think about the trial progress and data status reports that are needed for the study. And we will um, ask the lead node to start to think about what they will want to get from the data system to monitor the progress of the study and to start thinking about the specifications for those reports. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Frankie to talk about national training. Thanks again, Colleen. So at this point, um, pretty much all the planning is just about over, except for tying up a loose end here or there. Um, what you're doing during this process uh, is you're beginning to gather any items that need correction, um, looking to the future for hopefully just one amendment um, to kind of catch all of the bugs in the system. And so depending on whether the CCC is taking the primary lead on the national training or whether the lead node trainer is taking the primary lead, um, the national training then uh, involves a great deal of, of activity. If it's a face-to-face, -face, depending on the location where that training will be held, 
Um, negotiations for that may have needed to have been accomplished months in advance in order to uh, give time for the venue to have uh, an opening and to execute the contract for that. Uh, again, if you're in a face-to-face, -face, you need to think about things other than just the content, things like strategies for making sure that your presentations are entertaining, uh, allowing for comfort of the participants or, or breaks, um, even thing details like are the meals going to be provided as a part of the training or are they going to be an on-your-own sort of thing. And there are pros and cons to both of those. And here locally, when we when we do a national training, we always try to provide a personal touch that's funded by our local university. Uh, so, for example, if you've been to one of our trainings, you know that we typically do gift bags. We include a schedule of local events and some local maps. Um, and then we also try to build in some fellowship events like mixers or receptions um, just to, to add to the cohesiveness of the team. The other thing that you want to make sure of as you go into the national training is that there's a mechanism in place for refreshers uh, on down the road and also for the training of new and replacement staff. And let me pass that back to Eve and Colleen to talk about their piece of the national training. Okay, this is Eve again. Um, the big thing with the CCC, and I know we've talked about this several times, is you know really planning far enough ahead. And I have three to four months, and in some cases that even is a short time frame. It's like when you're planning a wedding, uh, this whole process of starting a study, you need to look at when you want to launch the study or when you want to do your national training, and you back everything up from there to really be able to get it all done. So, you know, as I've I have mentioned earlier we're going to be finalizing the training documentation form. We'll be deciding at what training will occur in person or remotely with the CCTN and then also deciding it with the, really the rest of the lead team, including the DSC and the um, lead node, and then really hammering out the agenda and the timing for all the different training activities. Now on to Colleen. And so by the time of the national training, we aim to have the final study base, database available so that we can provide training on Advantage EDC, Global Trace, and good data management practices at that training. We, at this point, will also have completed the development of the various users' guides and manuals that will be provided to research staff to support them in the use of our software during the study. And then we also develop uh, an Advantage EDC practicum that will be provided to the uh, research staff shortly after the national training so that they can go into our Advantage EDC training system and practice using the system and complete a short exercise to demonstrate their knowledge of the system before they have their first participant on which to enter data. At this time point, we also start to think about uh, data quality, and we begin to develop uh, integrity queries, and then we also begin to develop our trial progress and data status reports. Um, and those are done in collaboration with other members of the lead team um, as we talk about what types of things we want to monitor throughout the duration of the study. And actually, I realized, Colleen, when you mentioned that, I forgot to mention one thing that the CCC, well, several, but one thing that we really do try to do at the training meeting if it's an in-person meeting. And we work on the interactive audience devices, which allow for polling questions and for really assessing the comprehension of by the audience of the different topics that are being discussed throughout the national training. And sometimes it's used for you know, using music to pull people back in the room. Sometimes it's used for games such as Jeopardy and other things. And I, we, we've all seen Frankie and other folks really use the devices to a really, um, to the extent of really entertaining and, and pulling people back into the meeting from their breaks. So I, um, Kim, do you mind if I interrupt here really quickly? Uh, we did have a, a question in the Q&A, and I'd like to give others an opportunity to um, go back to the Q&A session um, before you all wrap up the discussion. But um, there was a question from Dorothy Sandstrom, and either of you can chime in. Her question is, talk more about developing the CRS, 
There are a lot of uh, things that need to be considered in their development, and I assume that the data center took care of this, but um, this is what she's saying. But um, I just want to ask for clarification there so that we can address her question. Thanks, Tracy. I can begin the question, then I'll pass it off to Colleen. I think when, when we're thinking about um, doing the, uh, the CRS development, a, a number of things uh, need to be taken into consideration uh, that we've kind of already talked about, but uh, one of the things that the lead team or the lead node really needs to do is um, really pay attention to how that CRS development impacts the budget. Uh, there are things uh, just to think about, like proprietary instruments. Um, are the instruments that you want to use in your study are they are they uh, you know open to the public? Are they public domain kinds of pieces, or are they proprietary? In which case, you you might have to get a license, and and in some cases, you might have to determine: Are you going to uh, use those licensed instruments? Are you required to use them on paper? Or in some cases, we've even had to develop. Um, additional uh, programs here at the OVN um, in order to, to access some of these uh, desired instruments. Uh, one of the nice things to think about is that the Alcohol and Drug Institute at the University of Washington has a really nice um, database of uh, substance use disorder assessment instruments. Um, that one of the things it tells there is whether or not that instrument is in public domain or whether it's proprietary. And if it's proprietary, how do you go about accessing that instrument? Other kinds of things to think about are the roles. Who's going to create them? Um, is it going to be the lead node or is it going to be the data center? Is it going to be a paper source or di direct entry? Um, Thinking about in, in terms of the timeline, how that impacts the regulatory piece, knowing that the overwhelming majority of IRBs require the CRFs as part of their submission, and then uh, really communicating because uh, there's a lot of, of uh, assessments that are already programmed into the data system, and so talking with the DSC very closely, even if you're developing your own CRFs, to talk about what's already in existence there, and it's, it's always easier to just go on and negotiate some adaptations uh, than it is to try to uh, create something whole cloth. Colleen, do you have anything to add to that? I think just to reiterate the idea of communication, there's no one right way to uh, develop the data system for a study and so but as long as you're communicating with the members of the team you can come up with a, an approach that works well for everyone and to make sure that things don't slip through the cracks. I also think that um, as we are entering in, or, or in an environment where um, you know funds are, are limited and we're being encouraged to really do faster, cheaper, better studies that looking at ways that we are not reinventing the wheel, so using um, assessments that have been used on, on other studies, thinking critically about whether you really need to do that assessment in this particular study and whether you really need to collect that um, piece of data is really important in the CRF development process. Thank you uh, for answering that. Now, if anyone else has a question, please press star 1, and we'll address those at this time. So at this point, we'll transition into the study startup phase. Finally, we've been talking for over an hour now on all the uh, activities that go to get to this point where we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel for um, beginning to recruit participants on study. So I will turn this over to Frankie. So briefly, at, at this point, we're, things are really revving up. Um, we're coordinating to uh, perform and follow up on the site initiation visits. We transition from the pre-implementation teleconferences to study management conferences. And at this point, your lead node really kind of turns into a cheerleader. We really want to motivate the teams to get them going. Uh, we also want to do things like establishing a mechanism for handling frequently asked questions as they come up. And our focus turns to recruitment and retention. Um, also, during this time, we really want to begin gathering feedback for, for modifications. And 
up to this point, everything is theoretical. Uh, we really don't know how this is going to play out until your teams actually have a chance to find out what's going on. Um, we had uh, so much fun with, uh, in CTN 46, uh, with kind of finding the bugs, debugging the system in the early days of the trial. And there was a fellow who I think is on uh, in the audience, Ricardo Cantu, uh, that we actually developed a, an award for. We called it the Pioneer Award, and we would send him an electronic raccoon hat uh, like Davy Crockett. Um, because he got so good at finding the systems and debugging it. I think the, the one thing to keep in mind is you want to give the trial time in order to discover the bugs. And so unless you can't function otherwise, try to avoid multiple amendments. Instead, gather feedback for just a little bit post-launch before you put out an amendment for all these little uh, tweakings of the system. Uh, that you've discovered since uh, the time that you did the initial submission. Eve and Colleen? Okay, so at this point, all the meds and supplies are on site. The sites have been sent a regulatory guidance kind of laminated page from the CCC so you know what, um, are, what uh, regulatory documents you need to upload into RTS versus those you may need to keep on site because that's what your IRB or your node requires. Initiation visits have occurred both by uh, your node staff and by the CCC. Reports are issued, action items are resolved, and hopefully right after that endorsement of each site occurs and screening and recruitment can begin. Colleen. And as soon as screening and recruitment begins, we're going to begin monitoring the data quality. We're going to look at missing forms, missing values, integrity queries. We're also going to keep our ears open to any issues that the sites may be having as they're using the data system and try and address those early, either through additional training, one-on-one, um, -on -one or, or more information on national calls or updates to some of our um, manuals and users' guides. And then we also will start to generate the trial progress and data status reports as soon as we have some data upon which to generate those reports. And so then our success is achieved when all of our sites are up and enrolling. And so one of the things that we then need to think about are some of the challenges and barriers that can come up during this process from protocol concept approval to the recruitment of the first participant. And so some of the challenges that um, we've encountered in past um, studies and that we've thought of are Unforeseen regulatory compliance um, issues, Eve and Frankie both talked a lot about um, the various bodies that need to review uh, protocol before it can go to the next step, and things may take longer than anticipated. Um, a, a protocol that has to go to the, I, or to the FDA, the FDA may come back with questions that may extend your timeline. Certain sites have multiple IRBs that they may need to submit to, and again, those IRBs may have questions um, that, again, can, um, can uh, extend the timeline. So the challenge is being able to keep up with the timetable and, um, and really to plan out and to plan for some of these um, barriers that may come up. We talked a lot um, over the past hour and a half about the need to effectively communicate. Uh, this is a large network and there are lots of players and so regular communication is key in establishing that very early on. How are you going to communicate? Who's going to communicate? Who's responsible for making certain decisions is really critical and and having um, a lack of effective communication can really impact the ability to stick with that timetable. You also need to consider um, the expertise of the sites and the staff that are uh, working on your study and whether they are new to research or even just if they're new to the CTN and learning the, how things operate within this network and providing time for that learning curve. And then sites um, may need to drop out of the study after site selection and, um, and being able to account for the time that it takes to appropriately select 
um, a, a site and to, being, and to be able to pick up when a site has been uh, dropped and quickly find a new one and get them up to speed to stick with your, your timetable. Um, and so I'll open it up to um, Eve or Frankie, anything else to comment on some of the challenges? I think you covered some, and they, there are always uh, some that crop up that you never dreamt of. <laughs> sometimes uh, interesting situations. Right. I think that's really the key is that it's all theoretical until you put it into play, and that's when you really find all kinds of fun things that you didn't expect. So we've tried to provide you with some um, tools throughout this presentation, a timeline template, a study budget, a pre-implementation calculator. Um, there's the CTN policies and procedures uh, guideline document. And all of these are located on the CTN investigator toolbox and can really be invaluable as you are planning your study. So I think the guidance that we have is that as soon as you get a protocol concept approved, that you go to the investigator toolbox, start to get some of these tools, start to plug in your planned numbers and your plan dates, and really refer back to them frequently throughout the study startup process. So I'll so turn it back over to Frankie. I can interject here, Frankie. Um, so I wanted to give others an opportunity to ask questions. Um, before you do your recap, but very quickly. Um, so if you have any questions, please press star 1, and I'll go ahead and open up your line. And after we leave these lines open or allow folks to ask questions, then, Frankie, you can go ahead and, and, and sort of wrap up the discussion. Okay. Okay, so we have no questions in the in the queue. Um, so, Frankie, please take it away. Okay, so I just want to quickly recap what we've covered today. I think the first point is that the end of the trial must be considered at the beginning of the trial. So you want to begin conversations about the details early. Uh, also, every decision has a cost associated with it from the, the time of each staff person to the cost of the bleach for cleaning the lab area. So you want to be able to consider the cost very carefully. Third, you want to determine early on how hands-on you want to be as a lead node. You want to negotiate ahead of time who will have the final say on, on each element. So make sure that you're determining what type of lead node you want to be. Fourth, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, the CCTN, the CCC, the DSC, perhaps Synergy, the sites, the nodes, um, everybody needs to be on the same page at all times. And so the only way to make that happen is to actively communicate with everyone. And then also don't forget to tell people what you're doing via updates in the CTN bulletin. Fifth, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Many people have gone before you. Uh, before you sit down to try to develop something out of thin air, ask to, to see if there's something that you can use whole cloth uh, or you can modify um, to help you in developing your documents and your tools. And finally, don't be afraid to reach out to existing resources. Check with other teams to see what they have done. And if you're so inclined, ask someone from a previous lead team to be a mentor for you. Frankie, we do have a question from Sarah Brewer, if you don't mind allowing her to ask the question. Sarah, can you go ahead and ask your question? Um, yes, sorry, thank, sorry for interrupting. Um, I have a regulatory question, I guess. Um, occasionally we get responses from our IRB with questions about the informed consent forms or protocols, and we typically try to handle ourselves, but I was wondering what the best way to handle these questions is. And I'm sorry, I tried to ask it earlier, and I wasn't able to get through. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll handle that, and anybody, Frankie or, or Colleen, you can jump in, too. I mean, again, I think part of the, the communication that we've been saying so much of is really important. So if something does come up, I would encourage you to while you may try to handle it yourselves, I would definitely share it with the lead node and with the CCC on one of the site calls or operations calls or whatever calls you all are involved in or by email or by direct phone call or email because 
if, if something has come up with your IRB, it may come up with others. It's uh, good for us to know about that question or that issue. And uh, we can look at it and, as Frankie had said, really collect information and, and evaluate whether it's something that might need to be adjusted at some future time point or if it's something that, you know, we just need to talk to your IRB about. Um, we had a situation where there was a, a new law in the state of Pennsylvania that caused some issues with starting a trial actually at a couple of sites, and we got the CCTN involved. We got um, lots of different people here at CCCDSC and CCTN and with the IRB and some of the state uh, lawmakers, and we actually were able to adjust things appropriately and explain things appropriately to them such that the study could go forward. So, you know, sometimes it's just... Uh, reiterating or stating something in a different way that helps someone better understand what you're trying to do. Uh, Sarah, I hope that answered your question. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'd like to thank um, you all for uh, giving this information to us. I know some of you have uh, participated on the call, but you have something to do with the process at some point in time, uh, particularly when it gets the study start, but you all touch the process in other places as well. So thank um, uh, Eve, Colleen, and Frankie. We enjoyed you sharing your expertise. I encourage all to respond to the survey about the, your experience with the webinar. And there has been a date change to our next webinar in December. It is now Friday, December 6th. We want to encourage as many to uh, come to that webinar as well. It's on secondary analyses, and um, it's a very important topic. So please spread the word. Uh, we're also going to send a notification about the date change. Um, it's Friday, December 6th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So, again, thank you all for participating. We will make this presentation and others available on the CTN Dissemination Library. And have a great day. Thank you all. And you may now disconnect.